Hey Flock, Mike here from Epic Duck Studios, and welcome to another Marvel Crisis Protocol comic style painting tutorial. This one, more accurately, is a cartoon style painting tutorial instead, though. I'm going to be using the 1990s X-Men cartoon series as my reference point. I'm going to start with a plain old Wolverine, end up looking like this, using a little bit of this. I'm going to be basing my style on a specific animation frame from the show. I'm going to be pulling all my color values from this with some very tiny deviations just to make painting a little bit easier. For the yellow parts of Wolverine's costume, I'll be starting with Avril Sunset as the base coat, and then highlighting that with Cygnus Yellow, followed by Sulfuric Yellow, possibly with a little white mixed in. For the blue parts, I'll be starting with Signar Blue Highlight, and I'll be mixing that with Underbelly Blue as a mid-tone and finishing off with Underbelly Blue. For skin tones, I'm going to use the usual suspects from Citadel, Bugman's Glow, Cadian Flesh Tone, and Kislev Flesh to build up successive layers. The red on Wolverine's belt is actually very bright, so we're going to start with Kador Red Base as our base coat color. Even though this is normally a fairly bright red that I keep towards you know the highlight kind of end of things, I'll be mixing in Mora White and possibly some of the skin tones to get my highlight colors. And of course, our black lining will be done with my favorite black ink, Higgins Black Magic. All right, let's get started with the Averlin Sunset base coat. I'm starting with the yellow because it's one of the colors that needs the most coats to get good coverage. Whereas Signar Blue Highlight will cover in basically a single layer. Averlin Sunset, because yellow paints are always just a little bit on the transparent side, it's gonna take two or three coats to really build the color up. It's also the most dominant color on the model. It covers the most area. And in fact, if I wanted to put the extra time in, Airbrushing the whole model with this as a base coat would be a real time saver in the long run. I just didn't really want to go through the process of setting up and tearing down my airbrush equipment. I also feel like using an airbrush in a painting tutorial that doesn't necessarily require it sort of adds a layer of complexity and kind of distances it, makes it harder for some people to feel like they can achieve, so I want to make sure I'm using nothing but straight brushes here. Now one small detail that's easy to forget is the yellow from the cowl actually extends down onto the bridge of Wolverine's nose, so you want to make sure you hit that as well. So if you're going for the classic 90s look on Wolverine, what you need to remember is that he has that blue sort of speedo over his costume, and that's not sculpted on this model. Basically all the other 90s centric details are, but that one detail is not. And so you just need to actually freehand that in. And that's just a matter of just basically leaving the crotch, the butt, and a little bit of the hip in blue. And I'm just going to facilitate that by not painting some parts of it yellow. So at this point, I think you get the idea of what I'm doing with the Averland Sunset. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to where it's done, where I've built up enough coats for good coverage. And we can move on to the blue. So for the blue base coat, I'm using Signar Blue Highlight, not Signar Blue Base, which is just a little bit darker because I just want that brighter, punchier blue. And first things first, I want to really work and define where that speedo shape is because it's a free-handed detail. I want to make sure it you know, flows properly with the musculature of the model. And this gives me an opportunity, while I've still got the yellow wet on my palette, to kind of do any back and forth tweaking I need to at the boundary. It actually turns out that this is a really easy detail to paint. You know, the model's got some really nice smooth curves to it that were really, really simple to follow with the brush. And this didn't take a lot of imagination, a lot of stress to really get in place. So now that we've got the speed out of the way, the next details we need to paint blue are going to be the boots, the gloves, and the shoulders. And all of them are just going to be straight base coats. There's nothing magical about this step. I'm basically just going to skip to the end here. I'm just going to show you a few little clips, kind of montage it together. And we'll just move on because it's just straight up base coats. It's worth noting the boots have a fairly large bit of trim around them, around the top. And it kind of cuts into that deep V on the front. So we don't need to take the blue all the way to the edge of the boot, just to the edge of that bit of trim.
So next up, I'm going to base coat the exposed skin using Citadel Bugman's Glow. This is going to be the arms and the face, and that's it. We're basically getting the smaller and smaller steps with each color. Now one thing to note here is the sculpt actually has some bare skin showing around the eye inside of the mask. So there's sort of, you know, mask, skin, eyeball in, you know, a bunch of layers. But if I want to really emulate the 90s cartoon look, the eyes just need to be filled with pure white. So I do start by base coating the skin in the eye and then basically decide I shouldn't have done that. So I'm going to go ahead and just throw pure white in those. But that's why you see me painting them right now when it doesn't really fit with the motif I'm going for. So I didn't introduce this color at the beginning of the video, but I'm going to be using the darker red P3 Amethyst Rose for the inside of the mouth, as well as some P3 Moro White for the teeth and the eyes. So as noted, there's actually some detail to the eye here. It's a sculpted eye with a little bit of surrounding eye socket to it, as opposed to just being a flat plane. So I'm really cheating by just filling it in with white. I'm really just hoping that the fact there's some detail there just isn't really obvious by the time I'm done. One of the last things to detail here is his belt. I'm going to pull out Kador Red Base for that, and that's because I want this to be a very bright, vibrant red because that's what matches the artwork I'm working from. The red is only used on his belt. It's not anywhere else on the model. I may pick a little bit of it up just to highlight the tip of his tongue, but beyond that, it's a kind of one-and-done sort of detail. Now one color I didn't introduce at the beginning is Iron Hull Grey, and I'm going to be using this as just a touch-up color for the rock and other basing elements where I may have got some blue or yellow on them, and also just to touch up the claws. Now the claws right now are actually bare primer. Now there's nothing wrong with that, it's a brush on primer, it's got some pigment to it, and it's the same color as the plastic. Now the funny thing is, I'm really doing nothing with these claws, they're not getting any sort of highlights or anything. And that's just because that's true to the reference art I'm using. There was no shiny points whatsoever. The claws are just flat gray, and so I'm sticking with it. So now I'm going to use that same white and pick out Wolverine's teeth. One thing I got wrong here is I thought there were teeth showing on the bottom lip, so I went to pick those out, then realized that was actually just the edge of the tongue. So I come back in with a little bit of Kato Red Base, the color from the belt, and use that to cover up where I accidentally paint the teeth on the bottom. So now I'm bringing in P3 Cygnus Yellow, and this is going to be just a general highlight to all of the yellow areas. Basically, I just want to leave the darker Avalon Sunset showing in, like, the creases of the muscle, and that's really about it. Almost everything yellow should receive a highlight, because really, this is the color we want the model to be. The shadows are a minor detail compared to just the overall surface color, but if we start with Cygnus Yellow, we wouldn't get very good coverage. So it's important to start with the Avalon Sunset, even if you're covering, like, 80% of it. The head is honestly the hardest part to highlight here with yellow, and that's simply because it's a large, curved, open surface. It doesn't have the same little tiny details that the muscles do. It's just one big surface, and so you've got to make sure your yellow coat is really consistent, and that's going to mean a couple layers. So at this point, pretty much everything has a yellow highlight now from Cygnus Yellow, and I'm just going over and doing a second pass in a few spots, because I want to make sure it's pretty bright and distinct.
So here I've mixed a little bit of P3 Mora White in with the Cygnus Yellow to get just a lightly yellow tinted white. It's definitely more on the white side. And I'm using this for a very sharp, cell shaded kind of highlight. So you'll see I'm bringing in these small, kind of linear details. And I'm not doing any really intentional blending around them. I'm keeping them pretty crisp and defined. And that's really just trying to harken back to that animation style where the highlights don't do things smoothly. They're just a sharp color break. So now I want to create the highlights on the blue areas. What I'm doing is I'm mixing the Cygnus blue and the underbelly blue together in about a 50-50 level. And then I'll be using the underbelly blue as the second highlight. And again, I want these to be very, very sharp, distinct shapes because I'm going for that cell shaded look as opposed to, you know, a more modern comic that might have kind of a blended transition to it. I want those sharp color breaks. So you can see I'm doing kind of big sweeping geometric shapes, a lot of sort of semicircular kind of volumes here. And what I'm doing is focusing that up on top of the shoulder and bringing just a tiny little bit around to the front as well, just to give kind of the appearance of an edge highlight. Then, of course, I'm just going to repeat that for the other shoulder, both front and back. Now I'm going to add another highlight to both of the shoulders using straight underbelly blue. And again, I want to make sure this is very, very consistent and opaque. I don't want to have any sort of blurriness or, you know, blending to this. So I'm making sure I go over it with a couple different thin coats just to make sure it's really consistent, just a solid cell shaded look to it. So now I'm going to use that mixed blue, the Signar blue mixed with underbelly blue, as well as the underbelly blue straight to add details to all the other blue parts of the costume. So that's going to be the gloves and the boots. And we definitely can't forget Logan's underoos. That's a really important part of this model. With these smaller details, it's not quite as important that you get those super crisp edges that I was aiming for in the shoulder pad because it's just not as evident on the smaller details. You're not going to notice that there's a tiny bit of a inconsistency at the edge of a highlight on a single finger compared to a big broad shoulder pad. So it takes a little bit less effort to get it looking right on these other extremities than it does on the shoulders. So now I'm back to underbelly blue, adding highlights to all those other details now, building that on top of our mixed blue. And it's worth noting that the underbelly blue is really what does the most work to inform the texture of the surfaces. So it's really what's following folds and wrinkles and hems in the clothing here. More so than the blue underneath it, because the blue underneath it might cover up one or two of those different details with just one larger area. Whereas these highlights, they're meant to be sharp and concise. And so we've got like sort of two adjacent folds in the fabric, for example. They might both be the same blue base coat or the same mixed blue base coat underneath this, but each of the different creases will get a separate little hit of underbelly blue. So underbelly blue is really, it's doing our work here to sort of really bring the texture of the model out in a very noticeable way.
Wolverine's gloves are a perfect example of using the underbelly blue to create some extra detail that's not present in the base coat or the mid-tone. You'll see there's two small wrinkles on his left wrist that are really only made evident once I add a little tiny line to each one in underbelly blue. With the blue highlights done, it's onto the skin tones. I'm going to be using Cadian Flesh Tone to highlight over the existing base coat of Bugman's Glow. Like the blue and the yellow, I'm not looking for any actual blending here. I want fairly stark, cell shaded style transitions between the colors, so very sharp, distinct line breaks. Because the skin is a lot of pretty small details, though, it's a little bit harder to manage sometimes. You do get just the effect of almost blending just because the details are so small. So don't really stress about it. You really get a lot of the... The shoulder pads carry a lot of the visual weight of cell shading. They have that very distinct element happening to them. And so it doesn't quite matter if it's absolutely perfect throughout the whole model. As long as the rest of it's kind of, you know, in the same stylistic vein. So if you get a little bit of a smooth transition just because the paints are a little bit translucent, just go with it. Don't don't stress about it. Don't stress about piling on a bunch of coats to make sure you get those really, really crisp lines, unless you want to. Now it's onto the final skin highlight using Citadel Kislev Flesh. Just follow the same pattern as the Cadian Flesh Tone, just narrow it down a little bit, and you're there. This step goes really quickly because it's only covering very small amounts of detail, and Kislev Flesh just covers over Cadian Flesh Tone really well. So you're going to find when you're doing this step, you just fly right through it. It takes no time at all. Now I want to mix up a highlight color for the red belt, and to do that I'm going to bring a little bit of the Kislev Flesh on my palette into the Kador Red base, and just mix those until I get something that looks distinct enough from Kador Red to use as a highlight. Now when I get to Wolverine's backside, there's some blue highlights on his underoos that I want to make sure there's a matching red highlight, so you'll see I make sure I focus a little bit of the bright red just basically above each of his cheeks, there's that just that bright blue patch, and I just want to make sure that the two highlights just line up with each other. To continue highlighting the red, I'm working with pretty much straight Kislev Flesh with just a little hit of red added to it at this point. And I'm going to just bring that in, you know, very tightly focused inside our previous highlights. Just a little bit across the top, and those two shiny spots we talked about, just a little bit really, you know, centrally focused on those points. So at this point, I'm almost ready to work with my black ink, and one of the last things I need to do before I do that is just get a little bit of detailing on the base. Now, I've been using mostly P3 colors here, but to tie back to all the other bases I've done, I'm going to be using Mechanica Standard Gray and Administratum Gray. And the main color here on the base is actually a 50-50 mix of the two, because Mechanicus is just a little bit too dark for my liking. Now this color is very close to the gray primer I've already used, so you're not going to see a whole lot change. That also means I don't have to worry about getting perfect coverage, because we've got gray paint on gray primer on gray plastic. It's gray all the way down. One thing I'm really watching for here is making sure I get coverage around the boot though, where I may have got a little bit of blue on the rubble. Now one thing I've been doing with my Marvel Crisis Protocol miniatures is marking their affiliation with their base rim. Now Wolverine, of course, is in like five or six affiliations, but he's also going to be the first model I'm starting the X-Men affiliation with, and I decided X-Men are going to be yellow. Now, this is a little bit confusing because if you remember my Venom video, I did Venom in yellow. I'm going to be changing Venom's color at some point. X-Men are getting yellow now as far as my affiliation color coding thing goes, 
But of course, Wolverine is in, like we said, he's in like four or five, maybe six affiliations. He's all over the place. He's in every team. So it's really actually getting to the point where like doing this is a lost cause. And I should just probably paint them all like black or dark blue or something cohesive across all the models at this point. But I'm sticking it out just a little bit longer until it just gets even more ridiculous. All right, with the base room insanity over and done with, it's time to add just a little bit of highlighting to the base. I'm using straight administratum gray here, which was the lighter of the two colors in that 50-50 blend. And I'm basically just picking out really just the sharp edges in the base here. So where the different sort of tiles or quadrants of the base meet the rim, I'm kind of just giving a little bit of a flange there. And some of the bigger cracks in the base, I'm just adding a little bit of a highlight on either side of the crack. It's just enough just to break up the fact that the base is otherwise just a big slab of gray and it's a little bit boring. It just adds one extra layer of detail and it's quick and easy. I want to make sure I add some highlights to Wolverine's little rock he's standing on as well. And basically, these are just important to kind of catch the different faces of the rock and make it appear like it has different planes and cleaves in it. They don't really have to make a lot of sense, they just have to help break the rock up. Alright, it's time for my favorite part of comic style painting, the black inking. For this, I'm going to be using Hagen's Black Magic, which is a waterproof artist ink. You can get this from most fine art stores in the inking or drawing section. If you can't get Hagen's, some other inks that work really well are Daler Rowney FW Black, Liquitex Carbon Black ink, and I haven't used it personally, but I hear Amsterdam Black ink works really well also. In general, you want to avoid inks that come from game paint companies because they're typically actually washes and not true inks. True inks are very, very opaque, very, very strong, and they just flow off your brush like water. There's just something special about using ink, the way it works with the brush. You know, you can definitely do this with black paint if you want to, but it's just a completely different experience doing this with black ink instead. And if you're planning on doing more than one or two pieces, I really recommend you spend a little bit of money on the good ink. So I'm getting the line work on the base out of the way before I really jump into the model itself. And that's just to help me refine my workflow, make sure my brushes are behaving correctly, make sure I'm getting my right line weights. Because it's a lot easier to fix the base than it is to fix some part of the model. So I want to make sure that when I'm using my size zero brush, I'm getting thicker lines. I'm using my triple zero brush, I'm getting nice little thin precise lines. and just. Like I say, just kind of dialing in what I'm doing. So when I'm adding these black details to a miniature, they kind of fall into a couple different categories. The first and most obvious one is I follow just the basic details of the model, and that's usually breaking a model down into its chunks. So that's lines that separate, for example, here, the foot from the rock, you know, the leg from the boot, the waistband from the belt, things like that. You know, the straightforward, linear breaks in the model that just isolate one detail from the next. The second form is the big bulky shadow and you'll see me later add these to the underside of Wolverine's arms and inside of each leg. And these are often used to create the impression of an outline on a detail or to create a sense of dynamic motion. For example when a model is standing with you know its legs sort of apart from each other by having the inside surface of the back leg be mostly black, it silhouettes the front leg and it makes the stance appear wider and it gives a sense of motion to the miniature. And so that's what I'm looking at when I'm creating those black areas. The third category is embellishing detail and that's doing things like the little lines that indicate folds in fabric or outline a muscle group, you know, facial contours, things like that. It's the details within the details. It's the small little folds, creases, cracks, etc within a color block as opposed to separating one item from the next item. And then finally, the fourth type is shading, and that's where I use small cross-hatched lines or very small just shadows painted in place 
to create either a sense of shading, a sense of, you know, contour and depth, or to sometimes create a little bit of a dynamic moment on a miniature. So what I'm doing right now is just working around Wolverine and breaking up the model into its constituent parts. So, you know, separating the boots from the pants, you know, the pants from the belt, the belt from the torso, and just that process. Now, Wolverine has one extra aspect that doesn't fall into those other categories in that there is a lot of this model that is just intended to be flat black. The stripes on his shoulders, the stripes on his sides, the trim on his boots, and of course a large part of his mask is just meant to be black, no highlighting whatsoever. Just straight, unadulterated black. And that's a really uncommon feature for a miniature, but I really want to capture that Wolverine 1990s X-Men aesthetic, so we're going with it. And that means that those details I'm going to paint with this pure black ink while I'm at it, even though that's not normally part of my process because they're not a shadow, they're not a line, they're not a break. They are a detail. Normally with details I want to have at least some kind of highlighting, but it's not authentic to the source material in this case. And so I get to play with the fact that they're just supposed to be this like super deep, unhighlighted black. It's kind of fun. Now you'll notice as I'm painting these black areas that I'm flipping the model around quite a bit and the reason for that is I find that my most consistent line that I can draw with the brush is a vertical line, is moving from top to bottom. So I'm always orienting the model to take advantage of that. So I'm kind of just rotating it so that whatever line I'm trying to draw is the most vertical line possible. I'm always sort of making that top to bottom motion. Moving left to right I find I'm more error prone and so I'm just playing into a, a bit of a strength. In general, this is a good habit to get into. Every painter has a specific brush stroke that they are most comfortable with. It's their most consistent performer. They're going to get you know, the most control of their line weight, their stroke direction, their brush flow, stuff like that. And once you recognize that and you start to make that sort of your primary direction or orientation that you paint in, you're going to get much more consistent results in the long term. So one of the last details here that needs a lot of black is, of course, the big wings on Wolverine's mask. You know, the two kind of sweeping parts coming off either eye. And there's a couple things worth noting here is that in this version of the costume, the two halves don't meet. In some cases, the nose is actually black. In this particular costume, it isn't. The nose is yellow. And so we want to bring the black down onto the side of the bridge of the nose on both sides, but leave just that little strip down the middle still showing yellow. We're also using the black to really control the shape of the eye because we've just mashed a bunch of white paint in there, filled the eye in because we didn't want to deal with the detail that's there because it's not relevant to this specific style. And so now what we need to do is with the black, we're really controlling the shape of the eye, how angry it looks, how you know squinted it is, things like that, and making sure both eyes have roughly the same weight and same shape. You'll see I also very quickly brought a small shadow underneath the jawline. That's just to make the jaw more dominant and really give it, you know, a bit of structure because otherwise it can kind of blend into the neck and you lose a little bit of the shape. And so by just giving the back of the jaw a little bit of an outline and then a shadow underneath the jaw, we see that structure more prominently from more angles of the model. So now I'm working on the inner details, you know, the folds in the fabric, the muscle groupings and so on that exist within a color group, within a color area of the model. So you can see, you know, I'm outlining his pecs and his abs, breaking up some of the details on the belt. I also forgot to paint the small X across his belt, so I'm just doing that right now. And that's really easy because it's just one of those details that's also still pure black on this model. So I'm just picking that out as I go, then coming back in, isolating the belt loops, 
and adding just a little more detail to the chest. Again, just coming in to pick out the muscle definition, the abs, the pecs, and the little folds in the fabric that are also present. Now, I don't want to overdo this. The artwork I originally chose to work from doesn't have a lot of that detail. It's really just the abs, pecs, and, you know, what's cool about the scene I picked to use in my references was Wolverine fighting Morph as Wolverine. And so we got to see Wolverine from two angles, which is a perfect reference. You can never, ever get that. It's not often where you have an image that's not an artist brief that shows the same character from both the front and the back. And it was just kind of like striking gold for this kind of work. Now some of these areas as I'm adding these inner detail lines, I'm also embellishing it with a little bit of a shadow. You can see for example when I came in underneath the kneecap, I let the line weight to be just a little bit thicker. And that's because that's a detail that you know sticks out from the body a little bit and would naturally have some shadow to it. Even though in comic style we don't necessarily care too strongly about natural shadows because we're trying to capture more an idea of like dynamic movement as opposed to, you know, honest physics based lighting. Cartoons and comic books for a variety of reasons are really really good at ignoring physics. And we get to as well. So since I'm already working on the legs, I'm going to jump ahead and get the block shadows in here. And so what block shadows do is they create opportunities for silhouette. And what I mean by that is I almost always with a character like this, I will have the shadows kind of facing each other on the inside of the legs. And the reason for that is when you look at the model from the side or anywhere where the two legs kind of visually intersect, the shadow on the back leg should silhouette the front leg. And what that does is it gives you a sense of depth to the character. I mean physical depth, not, you know, emotional depth. But it gives you a sense of depth to the character that being a miniature might take away from it. You know, when your legs are separated by five millimeters, it's really hard to kind of see, you know, the stride of an action pose sometimes. And the shadow set in between the legs like that to create visual distance between the back leg and the front leg can make that pose feel much more dynamic than it really is. Now of course when we start a shadow on the inside of the thigh we have to carry that all the way down the leg pretty much to the ground. You can sometimes skip around the heel just depending on the pose of the character but of course you want to at least taper the shadow off so it makes some sense. In this case though we've got you know a pretty strong beefy guy with really thick thighs and calves we can just carry that shadow all the way down to the ground and it looks fine and it does a really good job of building those silhouettes we want. With the block shadows out of the way, I'm going to get back now to just detailing the other leg, then working on the arms and so on. There's a fair bit of detail to add to Wolverine's back, starting with the crease at the back of the head, and then following along the spine, the shoulder blades, and so on. Now even though it doesn't create a silhouette in the same way it does on the legs, I like to add block shadows to the inside and underneath of arms, depending a little bit on how they're posed. But what this does is, well first of all our source material, the 90s X-Men comic, just had really thick heavy black shadows everywhere, even in broad daylight. It was just how the characters were drawn and so in a way it's just a nod back to our source material. But in another way what it also lets you do is create the impression of an outline in place. A black block shadow underneath the hand, for example, will look like an outline when the hand is viewed straight on as opposed to from the bottom. You'll just get this impression of a little bit of black drawn underneath the hand, and that helps sell the idea that the whole piece is drawn in place. You know, it makes it look more two-dimensional because we create a point where someone sees an outline that they expect to see from conventional two-dimensional art. And because they see a couple outlines that they expect to see, 
their brain does the rest of the work, and the whole miniature starts to feel more flat, more two-dimensional. And it works in conjunction with the outlines we create between details. So we've got lines where we can sneak them, fake lines where we can't, and then the human brain just does the rest of the work. So what you'll see as I add these block shadows underneath the arm is I use them as a sort of anchor point for some of the line work that is building the muscle definition up on the arm as well. The outline underneath a muscle will tend to sort of flare and taper and be a little bit broader when it meets the block shadow. And that really just helps pull the shadow out onto the model and gives the lining a sense of purpose. It all just works together. Now the hands are fun to work on because there's a lot of really small lines you have to focus on. You want to basically isolate each finger from its neighbors, as well as capturing some of the major angles in the palm of the hand if it's visible, you know, outlining the thin arm, the base of the thumb, and creating a little visual separation between the claws and the glove itself. So here I go now adding the thicker lines to Wolverine's right arm, you know, outlining the triceps, biceps, the elbow, all those really prominent details that are really well sculpted. And we're just accenting the sculpt, making them much more prominent by creating these nice fluid, you know, very, very visually distinct shadows underneath them. So next I'm just adding some little blemishes to the base. Like so far all I've done is follow the lines that are given, and now I'm adding some actual texture to the surfaces. And this is a bit hacky because I'm using some hash marks to add some of this detail, and hash marks don't belong in cartoons, they belong in comics. And the reason for that is, in a cartoon you don't want to have to draw the same sequence of tiny little lines frame after frame because you're not going to get it right and then it's going to look really jumpy and jittery. And that's why in cartoons, cell shading, we have very smooth shapes, whereas in comics we have a lot more, you know, shading done by brush stroke or pen stroke rather. And the two, that's the biggest distinction between cell shading and comic style in fact, is just the way, you know, way shading is done is very different between the two and it's mostly because of the medium of drawing single frames versus the medium of having to draw frames that move over and over and over. But this is a concession to make this base match all my other Crisis Protocol bases. Alright, so now I'm on to just touch-up work at this point. This is where I just go back to my base coat colors or my highlight colors. In this case, a little bit of Averlin Sunset. And mostly I'm just covering up places where my black lines either wandered a little bit, got too broad, just weren't straight enough. Whatever it was that made me unhappy with them. It's where I just bring in my base coat colors for an area and push back against the black line a little bit. Just where I need to clean it up. There honestly wasn't much to do here. Just a couple of lines, you know, across his back and on, I think, his right bicep. Just felt a little heavy, so just brought a little bit of the base coat color in, touched them up, and we're good to go. Alright, 1990s X-Men cartoon Wolverine is finished and ready for the table. You can really see here as I pivot him back and forth a little bit, you can really see the effect of that silhouetting shadow. Helps bring that right leg into the foreground more than if it was just yellow on yellow. You know, you get a little more of a stance from the character because of it. And it's really effective, even though it's just a little blob of black ink in each leg. And there we are. I hope you've really enjoyed this nostalgia-fueled Marvel Crisis Protocol tutorial. I think this piece, Wolverine, 
is tied with Venom as my favorite piece from Royal Crisis Protocol. And oddly, both of them are based on a 1990s Fox Kids cartoon series. If you follow this tutorial and post your work on social media, I'd love it if you tagged me either on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Even better, you can join me on Discord. EpicDuck.com slash Discord is a permanent invite link that will get you into the Epic Flock Discord. And you're more than welcome to share what you're working on or even ask for feedback or advice. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, do something epic. Hey, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed that one, please hit like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell so you get notifications when I post new videos in the future. If you want to take your support even further, you can do that at patreon.com slash epic duck. Every little bit helps keep the lights on and the paint flowing, puts new models on the table so I can make interesting videos, and most importantly, puts a roof over my family's head and food on the table. You can also join me for live painting shows several times a week at twitch.tv slash epic duck studios. I'd love if you came by and watched the show sometime and followed the channel. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who supported my content over the years, both past and present. It's been an absolutely wild ride, and I couldn't do this without all the wonderful fans and flockers out there. The hobby community is just an amazing group of people, and you really make this worth doing. So let's just keep on doing this together, making more content, and just being fantastic together for years to come. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, do something epic.